You ever had one of those projects where you're convinced it's an easy win, it's going to be maybe a weekend, maybe four days, maybe five days, if you're really slow and relaxed about it and just take your time. And then the client, in this case, it happens to be the one that you love, so you're physically incapable of saying no to her ideas, decides to just make the scope of the project creep just, just a little bit. Suddenly the project, the desk in this case, is a lot bigger physically. And then she starts adding decorative details that they're nice details, but there's something that you've never done before. And it turns out you're now 12 jigs down the rabbit hole trying to find books on the process because the internet just doesn't seem to have good information on it. It's four weeks later and you're panicking just a little bit. It's definitely not what's happening here. That's um, theoretical conversation for the cold open here of this video. Yeah, definitely. Definitely just some really basic string inlay that I've definitely done before and I definitely, definitely know what I'm doing and I'm not panicking. It's, it's definitely what's happened. Shockingly, the first step in the process of making stringing is to cut some relatively small strips. Between each pass of the bandsaw, the board is jointed. This ensures one edge and one face will always be square. These pieces end up around 2mm by 12mm, which is too thick and too wide for the purpose. I want 1 16th of an inch or 1.6mm thick to match the router bit, and only 4mm wide so I don't have to remove so much material. However, at this size, it already slips under the bands or fence, so I can't cut it down further there. Now you could use a drum sander, though once you start getting below 2mm, a lot of drum sanders will have problems with something this thin and it is a little bit fragile, but there are alternatives if you don't have a drum sander. For that we'll need a scraping jig. For this jig we'll need a few bits and pieces. It's not an overly complicated jig so it's nothing too extreme. You need a piece of plywood, MDF, hardwood, whatever, it doesn't really matter, it just needs to be big enough. Plain blade of some sort, could use a scraper, a card scraper. Plain blade's going to be perhaps a little bit easier some washers, some screws, and some threaded inserts, some bolts, threaded inserts that match up. You can use wood screws, I find that uh, they will wear out as you make the adjustments, wear out the, the hole, so these are perhaps a little bit better. And you will need a little bit of wood, or I guess plywood off cuts would also work, we're going to use this for both material support and as a guide fence for the blade for adjusting it up and down. But the first thing is just to lay a few things out. The blade shape is traced to know where the threaded inserts need to go to allow the blade to travel, as well as striking the line square to the blade vertically and horizontally. The first cut is to establish a slot for where the stringing will pass through, intersecting the blade. A shallow dado is made with multiple cuts. It really isn't worth the time to swap out the blade. Next, holes for threaded inserts can be drilled. These inserts will hold the blade in place. Alright, so I've trimmed it down and I've also added off camera this uh, dado that works exactly the same as the vertical one. This will act as a material support uh, because the blade isn't in line with the plywood, it's just slightly outside. You can see the blade is retained with two washers, two machine screws. As they're loosened and tightened, you can adjust up and down, but keeping that square is going to be troublesome. Hence the oh, dado. But this fence here, so if I butt it up against that while I'm adjusting, it's going to be consistently moved. It does assume that the blade is ground square to the side here, uh, but we'll see how we go. So what I'm going to do is add just a little bit of glue to both of these two fences, the keys, whatever you want to call them. The blade was sharpened to 8000 grit, hopefully improving the odds of a good scrape.
of my stack of stringing blanks, I suppose, that need to be thickness down. The blade is set to just nibble away a bit of it with the bandsaw and face. Carbide blade does leave a nice finish, but we still need to get these all to a consistent thickness. Pop it in and pull. Now, this is probably a little bit too deep of a cut. Don't want to be putting that much pressure on it. So let's just adjust it a little bit. I also tried flipping the blade around to see if it performed any better. I admit I got middling results with this scraping jig here. It was working, but it was pretty fiddly, and I think the jarrow that I was using is not well suited to that. It's very brittle, so I had a couple of pieces actually break on me. Uh, and the interlocking grain certainly isn't helping. It seems to catch a lot more. It was thicknessing it down, but it was just very slow. So maybe if I had have cut it at 1.7, 1.65 millimeters, and I only needed to go that small bit down, that would have been a really good solution. But unfortunately, it was just a bit too slow and I got a bit frustrated. So I did end up going to the drum sander. The problem with the drum sander is that it won't go down to 1.6 millimeters or um, 16th of an inch, it stops at about two millimeters. So these two millimeter strips didn't get any thinner. So I needed to use a platen. In this case, it's just a scrap of plywood that's relatively flat, relatively narrow too, and just long enough. And I've stuck three pieces or three strips of self-adhesive sandpaper down. This is 320 grit. You can use a fine grit sandpaper and it'll really stick the board down without needing to use any adhesives, which when you remove them could actually break the piece of wood because it's quite thin. So I could run multiples of these through the drum sander at a time and two passes is all it took to get it down to the correct thickness. It's just so much quicker and it gets the exact same result. So if you've got one, use that. Either way, using scraping or the drum sander, the results should really be the same in that it's a 16th, 1 16th of an inch thick strip. I just need to rip this down into a better size piece to go into the dados, grooves, for the string. Calling this a jig is extremely generous. This is the cutting platform I use for cutting veneer, so I'd butt them up against this fence, strike a line, and be able to cut through it either with a veneer saw or a knife, depending on what's going on. However, we're not going to use this part, we're just going to use the fence, and I've added another tiny little fence. It's barely more than the veneer, the stringing thickness put it up against there, get a marking gauge. Now, it does have to be a cutting gauge, so that's one with a knife rather than a wheel or a point. You could probably do it with a wheel, but the knife style is better. Uh, this is gonna cut the thickness that I want of the stringing. So I butt that up against the fence, and I'm just gonna take multiple passes. Uh, I'll get halfway through, flip it end for end, then keep on going, and it'll just split. The advantage of doing it this way, rather than at the bandsaw, is it doesn't go under the fence, and you also don't lose anything to the kerf. Same would apply if you're using a veneer saw, and because of the bevel on the blade, it does tend to pull everything nice and tight, so it's really hard to actually get things out of straight. Assuming that your fence is straight, I guess. Cutting the groove with a knife requires multiple passes from both sides, usually two to three on each size, then it severs pretty cleanly. Once it is severed, this process is repeated until I have at least a couple of extra pieces in case parts break during glue up. To cut the groove for the stringing, I'll be using a variety of tools, starting with the Veritas router plan. I'd actually ideally use the router plan for all of it, but I don't have the right size bit. The first thing is the stringing cutter. Um, it's got a proper name, inlay cutter head. Uh, it acts like a router plane blade, uh, except it's two knives that are stacked together with some shims in between it. So sort of like a dado stack for a table saw. You put the shims in it to get the outside cutters to the width that you want. Uh, in this case, it's scoring the wood, severing the fibers, particularly on the uh, cross grain 
cuts so that when you remove the material it's not going to tear out for a router plane. What would be really ideal is you do all the scoring cuts with the scoring blade then switch in the right size bit. Don't need to change the fence setting on the router plane. Then you can take out all the material that you need. It's a really neat way of doing it. But unfortunately I thought I had a 1 16th inch router plane bit but the smallest I have is the 1 8th inch and there's no stock available in the country so I'll be switching to using the router, electric router with a 1 16th inch router bit to do the actual stock removal. Really any router will do so long as you've got a nice edge guide that does have some micro adjustment. While I'm sure the router and bit can push faster, going slower with such a small and fragile bit ensures the least amount of deflection, particularly when going across the end grain. As the fibres were already severed, this is a very clean cut. Once all the outer layer dados are cut, the inner layer is cut by very carefully adjusting the fence. Using a chisel and a very small bench hook, one end of the stringing can be mitered. At this stage the exact length isn't known and rather than measuring a number, marking directly from the groove is preferred. The piece can be marked against the groove for length. With the length marked out I can take the piece back to the bench hook and rough cut to length. Then is back to the chisel to pair to fit. It's a very tight fit by design, so a little bit of liquid hide glue helps lubricate the pieces and it slides in much easier. Because of this tight fit, no clamping force is needed and the rest of the stringing can be measured, cut and inserted the same way. This process is repeated over and over for each joint, fine tuning as I went. The next day the glue is nice and dry and it's time to flush up the stringing so that it is well, flush. Don't have to get it super duper flush, we will switch tools before getting to that point, but a block plane works super well. You can use a longer body plane if you really like, but I found that the block plane provides enough control as well as getting uh, any of the undulations down pretty quick. Once you've got it pretty darn close with a block plane, the humble number 80 Scrape, uh, cabinet scraper, that's what it is. Uh, it does a great job. You can use a card scraper if you like, but I got this recently and I really, really like it as a tool. Uh, it'll take it down quite easily and doesn't worry too much, or doesn't care too much about grain changes, particularly with this jarrow, which has a lot of interlocking grain. So I don't have to be too concerned about that because at this stage, we really don't want any tear out. That's why I'm keeping these heavier shavings just in case I have to push them in to act as a bit of a filler for any issues I cause myself. The metal rule is great for a go, no go gauge to make sure there is no stringing proud of the desktop. That, that scrape surface has come out really nice. It is uh, very flat and even where the banding is. Nothing much left for it now except Sanding time. This is the first part of two of a desk I built for Natalie for her hobby painting earlier in the year. The next video will cover the desk construction itself. While making the string was a little bit frustrating because my jig didn't work out and honestly I'm not entirely certain why it didn't work, not a big deal in the end, the overall process was really quite enjoyable and I'm really happy with the result, particularly for my first time stringing. The process was really a lot more intimidating to get started than it was to actually make the stringing and the actually inlaying it into the tabletop so it will be something that I do more of in the future. Here's a bit of a final tip 
when you're making the stringing, make extra pieces, make a lot of it because it's a lot of bulk repeated work and then store it in some PVC tubing. So I've got a whole bunch of Jarrah uh, stringing that I can embed in the next project I want to without having to go through that whole process. It's already sized. I just have to pop the cap on, maybe put some tape on it so it won't break, and then this can be stored safely. The individual pieces aren't gonna break. And I can add different species of wood, different colors, so that I have this real decorative stuff ready to go. All I have to do is route a groove, and that's pretty fun and exciting. Hope that you'll give stringing a go, because it is really fun, and it makes things look a lot classier. Thanks for watching.